Hi guys, it's Jason of RKX.com. It's not in my nature to do long videos, so I have some really special stuff in this one. This is about the Colburn Bible's Lost Secrets of Phoenix. Now, out of the fog of the Dark Ages emerged strangers who walked the roads of an illiterate Europe, many of these men having traveled from the Middle East and Mediterranean. In their satchels were treasures of hidden away of lost scrolls, manuscripts on parchment, and fantastically built books of leather, paper, and copper, some with bronze bands and key locks. Now, the wars of Rome left valuable writings secreted away from the very old libraries of Pergamum, Rome, Alexandria, Carthage. Many who began acquiring these hidden libraries were ship navigators who accepted books as payment for packet, uh, passage. Now, these men wandered into Dark Age Europe, and gems, gold, wagons, livestock uh, were given in exchange just for the opportunity to copy a traveler's scrolls or his old book. The travelers would get free lodging during their stay in the township, castle, or city as their war diligently copied the manuscript. A rare book was a traveler's greatest asset, gain gaining him entry. Men would invite these travelers into wine and dine with their family just to hear what the book's contents were. were. Uh, you know, a few people were literate. The books were sheathed in bronze, copper, and iron decorative covers, bound with locks and chains, and some were even trapped. It's very, very, very intriguing histories. In this way, well into the Middle Ages, the learned acquired great books from the old world that found their way into the libraries of Roger Bacon, Geoffrey Chaucer, Hevelius, Isaac Newton, Dante Alighieri, Christian de Troyes, and the truly amazing occult histories of Francis Barrett. Now, shockingly detailed works appeared in Europe like the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage and the writings of Johannes Trithmius who taught Nostradamus, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, and even Paracelsus, being the student of Trithmius. Now, over 3,000 texts entered the libraries of Europe in this way. It was a very unique time when knowledge was very highly valued. Now, I introduced you a collection of writings, 685 pages, treasured for well over two millennia and copied multiple times over the centuries. Very old Jewish and Celtic literary treasures that were kept together. The Colbrin Bible. This collection was introduced to me on February 4th. Members of Archaics asking me what I knew about it after a Marguerite Elsbeth had mentioned it. Initially, I didn't even take it seriously. It was difficult for me to accept that in all my reading of ancient authors, I had never come across this book. It was difficult for me to accept that, and uh, I am glad that I that I looked. Now, because when I looked, I was blown away. Here in the Colburn Bible were texts from ancient Egypt, Phoenicia, and early Celts with the most detailed descriptions of Phoenix cataclysms that I had ever seen from any other ancient sources. Not even the Oralin text comes close, the Frisians having two pretty good Phoenix passages in a real close dating of the Great Flood. The records of the Phoenix visitations that I put together in a perfect world timeline are from ancient Akkadian, Ugaritic, Phoenician, Babylonian, Egyptian, and Greek records, often annals or fragments. But in the Colbin text, we have elaborate, very detailed eyewitness testimony of what Phoenix did and what people saw. It is absolutely amazing what is in this video. I have finished my data mining of the Colburn 685 pages and isolated all the Phoenix passages, which is spread across a total of 35 long pages that I extracted. This video was packed with amazing data and even a prophecy passage about the last days that is harrowingly, harrowingly accurate today. It's awesome. The publishers and early translators of the various texts that became the Colburn Bible are aware of a chain of custody from Jewish owner, Celtic and Phoenician possessors of ancient copies, ultimately from Egypt. Whether this is entirely accurate is forgivable, due to its change of ownership at least 50 times over a 2,000 year period. The earliest composition claims to have been an Egyptian hieratic and simply called the Great Book, carried out of Egypt by the Israelites, dating itself approximately 1500 BC. The majority of the historical narratives, uh, it covers 4,300 4, to 1411 BC, the pre-flood world to the Exodus event, which makes this a pretty remarkable find. Intriguingly, over the millennia, only one copy of this archive of text survived the tumult of the ancient world. Just like one copy of the Oral End manuscript and one single copy of Beowulf survived today, as well as the Voynich manuscript, only one copy of the Slavonic Enoch titled Secrets has survived the ancient world. This great book, the Colburn Bible, arrived by Phoenician ship to the British Isles 2,000 years ago. Any other copies have been lost or destroyed. There it stayed until 1184 when it was rescued from a fire at Glastonbury Tor. Celtic priests took the manuscript away and spent years transcribing the fragile text onto bronze sheets to put together the bronze book. First metal edition of the Colburn Bible.
I have found in Colburn Bible forward and in intextual evidence that the 685 pages we have today is an abbreviated edition, the original probably closer to a thousand pages. This was a common practice in antiquity when copying manuscripts to shorten the length of any material that could be removed uh, that would be that would injure that would not injure the integrity of the text. Lastly, the bronze book was merged with an ancient Celtic wisdom text into a single work called the Coal Book in the 18th century, from which we obtained its current name, the Colburn Bible. Now, the veracity of its provenance may have issues, for books pass through many hands throughout history. However, the value of a text is measured by its content. Does it offer evidence of its claims in textually, cross reverence to historical known places and events, and does it possess very specific data that other texts also relate? The Colburn Bible meets all three standards. The edition popular today in 2006 by the publisher Your Own World Books, which added a citation system and made necessary grammatical corrections, is the version I'm using today. The detail-specific data on the Phoenix destruction during the Old World in the Colburn Bible is fantastically descriptive beyond anything found outside its pages. Phoenix is referred in hundreds of ancient texts in passing or fragmented quotes and short notations in regnal records, but in the Colburn Bible, there are whole pages narrative eyewitness accounts. The following material is in the exact chronological order as provided in the text, and as the entire collection is 685 pages, what is shared with you here is only 3.5% of it, because the majority of the Colburn Bible concerns itself with religious, spiritual, and doctrinal matters having nothing to do with cataclysms. But this 3.5% is still a lot of amazing knowledge. Throughout the narrative, my own interjections are made, facts you will want to know that bring clarity to the text. Many people in passing 2,000 years ago at least went to great trials in preserving this knowledge for future posterity. So let's hear what these texts have hidden. This is Jason of Archaics.com. Enjoy this presentation. The Colburn Bible is separated into several books. The first is called the Book of Creation. In the Book of Creation 1-2, we read, there are no true beginnings on earth, for here all is effect, the ultimate cause being elsewhere. This, then, is how these things were told in the great book of the sons of fire. Sounds like a controlled holosphere to me. God laid his hand upon man, saying, now you are even as I, except you sleep. They're enclosed in matter in the kingdom of illusion, while I dwell here in the freedom of reality and truth. It is not for me to come down to you, but for you to reach me. Again, I'm reminded of Maya, the world of illusion, the ancient Vedic texts. I refer again to the holosphere. In chapter 3 of the book of creation called Destruction and Recreation, we read in chapter 3, verse 1, It is known... And the story comes down from ancient times that there was not one creation but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once, then reborn on a second wheel of creation. Now, concerning this wheel, Earth moved into our present solar system on this new ecliptic plane. That's a wheel after the day star imploded into Nemesis. Genesis also describes two creations, and this is known by all biblical scholars. Notice that nowhere in the Colburn Bible are any books of the known Bible mentioned. This is evidence of being older. It is also evidence of being an independent writing. Now, in the book of Creation 3.2, we read, at the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of the heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold. It lashed its tail. It breathed hot fire and coals, and a great catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold, bright light, and beneath, on the belly, was a ruddy-hued glow, while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke. It spewed out cinders and hot stones, and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick, darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land. There was an awful shrilling trumpeting from the sky, which, which outpoured even the howling of the unleashed winds. Now, <clears throat> my own note here is Phoenix identified in the oldest records as a sky dragon, the trumpeting sound accompanying every visit. 
In the book of Creation 3.3, we read, Men, stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked out from their bodies, and they were burnt with a strange ash. Then it happened, leaving earth and wrapped within a dark and glowering, glowering mantle, which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals, and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders. It poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearful, fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man. His thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. Book of Creation 3.5 The earth vomited forth great gusts of foul breath from awful mouths opening up in the midst of the land. The evil breath bit at the throat before it drove men mad and killed them. Those who did not die in this manner were smothered under a cloud of red dust and ashes as, were, as they were swallowed by the yawning mouths of earth or crushed beneath crashing rocks. Now, the cloud of red dust is a signature of Phoenix in all the old accounts, as many of you know who have been following my books and videos. The Book of Creation 3.6, the first sky monster was joined by another, which swallowed the tail of the one going before, but the two could not be seen at once. The sky monsters reigned and raged above the earth, doing battle to possess it, but the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces, and their falling bodies enlarged the land and sea. Note, Mother Shipton and Nostradamus both describe two back-to-back -back world destructions in the last days, one of the culprits being called a sky dragon and the return of the sky dragon. Now, Book of Creation 3.7 In this manner, the first earth was destroyed by calamity descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than any that had ever haunted the dreams of men. Book of Creation 3.8 Men and their dwelling places were gone. Only sky boulders and red earth, red mud, remained where once they were. But amidst all the desolation, a few survived, for man is not easily destroyed. They crept out of the caves and came down from the mountainsides. <coughs> Excuse me. Book of Creation 3.10 then the great canopy of dust and cloud, which encompassed the earth, enshrouded it in heavy darkness. Was pe it was pierced by a ruddy light, and the canopy swept down in great cloud bursts and raging storm waters. Cool moon tears were shed for the distress of earth and the woes of men. Book of Creation 3.11 When the light of the sun pierced the earth's shroud, bathing the land in its revitalizing glory, the earth again knew day and night, for there were now times of light and times of darkness. The smothering canopy rolled away, and the vaults of heaven became visible to men. Book of Creation 3.12 The rainstorms ceased to beat upon the faces of the land, and the waters stilled their turmoil. Earthquakes no longer tore the earth open, nor was it burned and buried by hot rocks. The land masses were reestablished in stability and solidity, standing firm in the midst of the surrounding waters. The oceans fell back to their assigned places, and the land stood upon its foundations. Life was renewed, but it was different. Man survived, but he was not the same. Man stood in the midst of renewal and regeneration. He looked up into the heavens above in fear for the awful powers of destruction lurking there. Henceforth, the placid skies would hold a terrifying secret. When men came forth from their hiding places and refuges, the world their fathers had known was gone forever. The face of the land was changed. The earth was littered with rocks and stones which had fallen when the structure of heaven collapsed. One generation groped in the desolation and gloom, and as the thick darkness was dispelled, its children believed they were witnessing a new creation. Time passed, memory dimmed, and the record of events was no longer clear. Generation followed generation, and as the ages unfolded, new tongues and new tales replaced the old. I remind you that this text was written over 2,000 years ago. The Book of Creation 4.3 There were some who struggled harder. More were disciplined, because their forefathers had crossed the great dark void. Their desires were turned Godward, and they were called the children of God. Book of Creation 4.4 4. Their country was undulating and forested. It was fertile, having many rivers and marshes. There were great mountains to the east and to the west, and to the north was a vast, stony plain. This describes ancient North America between the Rockies and Appal Appalachians. Book of Creation 4.5 
Then came the day when all things became still and apprehensive, for God caused a sign to appear in the heavens so that men should know the earth would be afflicted. And the sign was a strange star. Book of Creation 4.6 the star grew and waxed to a great brightness and was awesome to behold. It put forth horns and sang, being unlike any ever seen. So men, seeing it, said unto themselves, Surely this is God appearing in the heavens above us. But the star was not God, though it was directed by his design. But the people had not the wisdom to understand it. Note, Phoenix is said in the Nag Hammadi text to be from God, a weapon against the rulers of this world. Phoenix always appears as a red star in the heavens before it gets huge and fills up the sky looking like a red dragon. Now, Book of Creation 4.8 Such was the likeness and manifestation of God in those days. Awesome was his countenance, terrible his voice of wrath. The sun and moon hid themselves in fear, and there was a heavy darkness over the face of the earth. Remember the Genesis text in the very beginning. This is what this is describing. Genesis says, And darkness covered the face of the deep. Now, Creation, Book of Creation 4.9, great fires and smoke rose up from the ground and men gasped for air. The land was rent asunder and swept clean by a mighty deluge of waters. A hole opened up in the middle of the land. The waters entered and it sank beneath the seas. Book of Creation 4.10, the mountains of the east and west were split apart and stood up in the midst of the waters, which raged about. The north land tilted and turned over on its side. Now, what's being described here is the 3895 B.C. lithospheric displacement. It is the only time the crust of the earth has actually moved and slipped over the mantle in recorded in, in, in traditional history. In histories that we know that there are traditions of when people were here and remembered these things. Now, this was year one of the pre-flood world's 1656 years. It was started by a pole ship caused by Phoenix in May 3895 B.C., for which we have several videos on. Now, the Book of Creation 411 then again, the tumult and clamor ceased, and all was silent. In the quiet stillness, madness broke out among men. Frenzy and shouting filled the air. They fell upon one another in senseless, wanton bloodshed. Neither did they spare women or child, for they knew not what they did. They ran unseeing, dashing themselves to destruction. They fled to caves and were buried, and, taking refuge in trees, they were hung. There was rape, murder, and violence of every kind. Some of the people were saved upon the mountainsides, upon the flotsam, but they were scattered far apart over the face of the earth. They fought for survival in the lands of uncouth people. Amid coldness, they survived in caves and sheltered places. Now, <clears throat> Book of Creation 414. The land of the little people and the land of the giants, the land of the necklace ones and the land of marshes and mists, the lands of the east and west were all inundated. The mountain land and the lands of the south, where there is gold and great beasts, were not covered by the waters. They were less than children in those days and could not know that God had afflicted the earth in understanding and not willfully for the sake of man and the correction of his ways. Sounds to me that almost the entire world uh, flooding was experienced everywhere but the continent of Africa. Which is interesting because Lenormand and several historians in the 18, I mean, the early uh, 19th century were convinced that flood traditions were known all around the world, and the only race that had absolutely no traditions of a great flood were the African. Very interesting. <clears throat> in the Book of Creation 4.16, we read, The earth is not for the pleasure of man, but it is a place of instruction for his soul. A man, a man more readily feels the stirrings of his spirit in the face of disaster than in the lap of luxury. The tuition of the soul is a long and arduous course of instruction and training. Sounds like reincarnation theology to me. Rebirth and simulation till the soul is ready to exit. Now, we get to the next book. In the Colburn Bible, it's called the Book of Gleanings. In the Book of Gleanings 415, we read, The remnants of the sons of Nazira remained upon the mountains which are against Ardis by the land about the encampment of Lamech. In Ardis, there were wise men filled with inner wisdom who read the book of heaven with understanding and knew the signs. They saw the deeds of men in all the lands about the mountains and how it brought, and how it brought them to that hour. Then the day came when the lady of the night changed her garment for one of a different hue and her form swept more swiftly across the skies. Her tresses streamed out behind in gold and copper, and she rode in a chariot of fire. The people in those days were a great multitude, and a loud cry ascended into heaven.
Now, for a little context, after the pole shift, the new vapor canopy alters the appearance of the moon. Human population explosion among lunar worshippers and a smaller group of wise men and artists, which is referenced in the Book of Enoch as the origin of the Watchers who brought civilization to the pre-flood people. Lamech sounds to me very close to the Sumerian pre-flood city of Larak, or Hebrew pre-flood name Lamech. Now, in the Book of the Gleanings, 416, we read, Then the wise men... The wise men went to Sharapik, now called Serapesh, and said to Sisuda the king, Behold, the years are shortened, and the hour of, hour of trial draws nigh. The shadow of doom approaches this land because of its wickedness. Yet, because you have not mingled with the wicked, you are set apart and shall not perish. This, so your seeds may be preserved. Then the king sent for Hanok, son of of Hogarater, and he came out of Ardis, for there he had heard a voice among the reeds, saying, Abandon your abode and possessions, for the hour of doom is at hand, neither gold nor treasure, but a reprieve, by a reprieve. Now, again for context, described here is the pre-flood city of Shurapak, mentioned so many times in ancient Sumerian and Babylonian records, and Hanok is a reference to Kanok or Henok, who we know of in the biblical record is Enoch, before the flood who came down from Ardis, which is mentioned in the book of Enoch, the flood who sailed from the homeland to arrive in Sumer with the knowledge of civilization. Enoch led the Watchers, but in Sumerian, Enki led the Anuna. Both arrived by ship with the ingredients of civilization right after a cataclysm. Now, in the Book of the Gleanings 423, we read, The king had entered, and with those of his own blood, and all, 14 in all, for it was 14 that his, house, that his household went into the ship. Of all the people who entered with him, Two understood the ways of the sun and moon, and the ways of the year and the seasons. One, the quarrying of stones. One, the making of bricks. And one, the making of axes and weapons. One, the playing of musical instruments. One, bread. One, the making of pottery. One, the care of gardens. And one, the carving of wood and stone. One, the making of roofs. One, the making working of timbers. One, the making of cheese and butter. One, the growing of trees and plants. One, the making of plows. One, the weaving of cloth and making dyes. One, the brewing of beer. One, the felling and cutting of trees. One, the making of chariots. One, dancing. One, the mysteries of the scribes. One, the building of houses and the working of leather. There was one skilled in the working of cedar and willow wood. He was a hunter. One who knew the cunning of games and circus. He was a watchman. There was an inspector of water and wells, a magistrate and a captain of men. There were three servants of God. There was Hanok and his brother and their household, and Divin and six men who were strangers. Now, what we have here is Enoch brought technology to Sumer. The list of trades is echoed in the book of Enoch concerning the knowledges that the watchers gave to humanity in exchange for their daughters. Now, now is detat detected a lacuna in the text, either a missing removed section or the narrator jumps straight to the next appearance of Phoenix, the Great Flood. He went from flood to flood. Okay, in the Book of Gleanings 424, then with the dawning, men saw an awesome sight. There, riding on a black rolling cloud, came the destroyer, newly released from the confines of the sky vaults, and she raged about the heavens, for it was her day of judgment. The beast with her opened its mouth and belched forth fire, hot stones, and a vile smoke. It covered the whole sky, and the meeting place of earth and heaven could no longer be seen. In the evening, the places of the stars were changed. They rolled across the sky to new stations. Then the floodwaters came. The Book of Enoch also describes a minor pole shift. Not total lithospheric displacement as happened in 3895 BC or year one of the pre-flood world the new heavens and the new earth, uh, the vapor canopy world beginning. This was, this was a temporal pole shift. There was no crustal displacement. With this passage in the Book of the Gleanings, chapter 4, we arrive at the Great Deluge, 2239 B.C., the month of May. In 425, we read, The floodgates of heaven were opened and the foundations of earth broke apart. The surrounding waters poured over the land and broke upon the mountains. The storehouses of the winds burst their bolts asunder, so storms and whirlwinds were loosed to hurl themselves upon the earth. In the seething waters and howling gales of buildings were destroyed. 
Trees were uprooted, mountains cast down. There was a time of great heat. Then came bitter cold. The waves over the waters did not rise and fall, but seethed and swirled. There was an awful sound above. Note that sound again. A phenomenon of Phoenix is the deafening roar in the sky. Book of the Gleanings 426. The pillars of heaven were broken and fell down to earth. The sky vault was rent and broken. The whole of creation was in chaos. The stars in the heavens were loosened from their places, so they dashed about in confusion. There was a revolt on high. A new ruler appeared there and swept across the sky in majesty. The destroyer passed away into the fastness of heaven, and the great flood remained seven days, diminishing day by day as the waters drained away to their places. Then the waters spread out calmly, and the great ship drifted amid a brown scum and debris of all kinds. Authenticity is lent to this account because it references anciently well-documented flood details, but does not cite any known texts, showing this is an original composition. Now, in the Book of Gleanings 429, after many days the great ship came to rest upon Cardu in the mountains of Ashtar, against Nishim in the land of God. This is Mount Ararat in Turkey. Now we get to the third book. In the Colburn Bible, we get to the Book of Scrolls. In the Book of Scrolls 33:23, we read, We had been told the ways of men from olden times, but we heeded not the warning. 33:24. Now the truth is scattered to the four quarters of the earth. 33:25. These writings have been rewritten with diligent care. They have been transcribed exactly as they are, and no thought or belief of mine has gone into them. May, may those to whom they come as a heritage be no less circumspect in dealing with them. Book of the Sons of Fire They came from the temple of the lake dedicated to the bright-bearded one, who once saved earth from destruction through fiery hail by making a third round. This is an obscure statement. It mentions a savior, a bearded person, implying the saved were smooth skinned with no facial hair. And this is a very common denominator as known in many of my other videos. The Book of Manuscripts, Chapter 1, Scroll of Emod. It begins, The writings from olden days tell of strange things and of great happenings in the times of our fathers who lived in the beginning. All men can know of such times is, de is declared in the Book of Ages. But the gods had their birth in events and things which were in the beginning time. Chapter 3, The Destroyer, Part 1. This is, exact, this is the same book, Book of Manuscripts. Men forget the days of the Destroyer, only the wise know where it went, and that it will return at its appointed hour. Note, a knowledge of Phoenix visitations, actual historical predictions, is listed by me in two or three of my, my Phoenix videos. It had been accurately predicted on several occasions. Book of Manuscripts 3.2 It raged across the heavens in the days of wrath, and this is its likeness. It was as a billowing cloud of smoke and wrapped in a ruddy glow, not, in, not distinguishable in joint or limb. Its mouth was an abyss from which came flame, smoke, and hot cinders. When ages pass, certain laws operate upon the stars in the heavens. Their ways change. There is movement and restlessness. They are no longer constant, and a great light appears redly in the skies. Redly in the skies. Phoenix appears initially as a strange red star. Remember that. Same book, chapter 3, verse 4. When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. Trees will be destroyed and all living things engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land and sea, and the sea will boil. There it is again. Red rains, blood rains are a phoenix phenomenon. Nibiru records have never yielded a similar description. Now, 3.5. The heavens will burn brightly and redly. There will be a copper hue over the face of the land, followed by a day of darkness. A new moon will appear and break up and fall. 3.6. The people will scatter in madness. They will hear the trumpet and battle cry of the destroyer and will seek refuge within dens in the earth. Terror will eat away at their hearts. Their courage will flow from them like water from a broken pitcher. They will be eaten up in the flames of wrath and consumed by the breath, the breath of the destroyer. Here is a very interesting prophecy text, the only prophecy that I found in all of the Colburn Bible, and it's a prophecy that's very relative to the Phoenix research. 
In the book of manuscripts 3.7 we read, Thus it was in the days of heavenly wrath which have gone, and thus it will be in the days of doom when it comes again. The times of its coming and going are known unto the wise. There are the signs of times which shall precede the destroyer's return. A hundred and ten generations shall pass in the west, and nations will rise and fall. Men will fly in the air as birds and swim in the seas as fishes. Men will talk peace with one another. Hypocrisy and deceit shall have their day. Women will be as men, and men will be as women. Passion will be a plaything of man. Men shall be divided by their races, and the children will be born as strangers among them. Brothers shall strive with brother and husband against wife. Fathers will no longer instruct their sons, and the sons will be wayward. Women will become the common property of man, and will no longer be held in high regard and respect. Book of the Manuscript 310. In those days, men will have the great book before them. Wisdom will be revealed. The few will be gathered for a stand. It is the hour of trial. The dauntless ones will survive. The stout-hearted will not go down in destruction. The, of course, evidently, there will be people who are awakened in the last day who will survive the phoenix return with little loss. The text continues. O mortal men who wait without understanding... Where will you hide yourselves in the dread days of doom, when the heavens shall be torn apart and the skies rent in twain, in the days when children will turn gray-headed? This is the thing which will be seen. This is the terror your eyes will behold. This is the form of destruction that will rush upon you. There will be a great body of fire, the glowing head with many mouths and eyes ever-changing. Terrible teeth will be seen in formless mouths, and a fearful dark belly will grow redly from fires inside. Even the most stout-hearted man will tremble, and his bowels will be loosened, for this is not a thing understandable to men. That is very weird. That is very interesting, man. What's being described is the destroyer. And we know from other ancient records, Phoenix was the destroyer. It returns May 15th or May 16th in the year 2040. And for those who are not familiar with that, we have about 17 videos on the Phoenix phenomenon. You watch those 17 videos and you're, you're still an unbeliever, then you're not going to believe in anything. Now we're going to move on. The Book of Manuscripts, Chapter 5, Verse 1. The doom shape called the destroyer in Egypt was seen in all lands thereabouts. In color, it was bright and fiery, in appearance changing and unstable. It twisted about itself like a coil, like water bubbling into a pool from an underground water supply. And all men agree it was the most fearsome sight. It was not a great comet or a loosened star, being more like a fiery body of flame. Its movements on high were slow. Below, it swirled in the manner of smoke, and it remained close to the sun, whose face it hid. Remember, Phoenix routinely hides the sun. There was a bloody redness about it, which changed as it passed along its course. It caused death and destruction in its rising and setting. It swept the earth with a gray cinder rain and caused many plagues, hunger, and other evils. It bit the skin of men and beasts until they became mottled with sores. The earth was troubled and shook. The hills and mountains moved and rocked. The, the dark smoke-filled heavens bowed over earth, and a great howl came to the ears of living men, born to them upon the wings of the wind. It was the cry of the dark lord, the master of dread. Thick clouds of fiery smoke passed before him, and there was an awful hail of hot stones and coals of fire. The doom shape thundered sharply in the heavens and shot out bright lightnings. The channels of water were turned back unto themselves when the land tilted, and great trees were tossed about and snapped like twigs. Then a voice like ten thousand trumpets was heard over the wilderness, and before its burning breath the flames parted. The whole of the land was moved and mountains melted. The sky itself roared like ten thousand lions in agony, and bright arrows of blood sped back and forth across its face. Earth swelled up like, like bread upon the hearth. It, now, the introduction of the term doom shape leads another layer, of, it pretty much lends another layer of credibility to the antiquity of this narrative. Original description of a historically known object, doom shape. Now, in the book of Manuscripts, chapter 5, verse 4, this is what we have. This was the aspect of the doom shape, called the destroyer, when it appeared in days long gone by in olden times. It is thus described in the old records, few of, few of which remain. It is said that when it appears in the heavens above, 
earth splits open from the heat like a nut roasted before the fire. Then flames shoot up through the surface and leap about like fiery fiends upon a black upon black blood. The moisture inside the land is all dried up. The pastures and cultivated places are consumed in flames, and they and all trees become white ashes. The doom shape is like a circling ball of flame which scatters small fiery offspring in its train. It covers about a fifth part of the entire sky and sends writhing snake-like fingers down to earth. Before it, the sky appears frightened, and it breaks up and scatters away. Midday is no brighter than night. Remember, Phoenix chief attribute, dar attribute is darkening the sun. It spawns a host of terrible things. These are things said of the destroyer in the old records. Read them with solemn heart, knowing that the doom shape has its appointed time and will return. It would be foolish to let them go unheeded. Now, men say such things are not destined for our days, but they are wrong. Chapter 6, The Dark Days. Book of Manuscripts. Now, we see the phoenix visits, visits Egypt. This is the Exodus Cataclysm. Book of Manuscripts 6-1 The dark days begin with the last visitation of the destroyer, and they were foretold by strange omens in the skies. All men were silent and went about with pale faces. The leaders of the slaves, which had built the city to the glory of Thom, Thutmos, stirred up unrest, and no man raised his arm against him. They foretold great events of which the people were ignorant and of which temple seers were not informed. These were days of ominous calm, when the people waited for they, they knew not. The presence of an unseen doom was felt. The hearts of men were stricken. Laughter was heard no more, and grief and wailing sounded throughout the land. Even the voices of children were stilled, and they did not play together, but stood silent. The slaves became bold and insolent, and women were the possession of any man. Fear walked the land, and women became barren with terror, for they could not conceive, and those with child aborted, all men closed up within themselves. The days of stillness were followed by a time when the noise of trumpeting and shrilling was heard in the heavens, and the people became as frightened beasts without a herdsman. The public records were cast forth and destroyed, and no man knew who were slaves and who were masters. The people cried out to Pharaoh in their distress, but he stopped his ears and acted like a deaf man. There were those who spoke falsely before Pharaoh, Pharaoh in those times, and had gods hostile towards the land. Therefore, the people cried out for their blood to appease it. But it was not these strange priests who put strife in the land instead of peace, for one was even of the household of Pharaoh and walked among the people unhampered. Dust and smoke clouds darkened the sky and colored the waters upon which they fell with a bloody hue. Plague was throughout the land. The river was bloody and blood was everywhere. The water was vile and men's stomachs shrank from drinking. Those who did drink from the river vomited it up for it was polluted. The dust tore wounds in the skin of man and beast. In the glow of the destroyer, the earth was filled with redness. Vermin bred and filled the air and face of the earth with lo loathsomeness. Wild beasts, afflicted with torments under the lashing sand and ashes, came out of their lairs in the wastelands and cave places and stalked the abodes of men. All the tame beasts whimpered, and the land was filled with the cries of sheep and moans of cattle. Trees throughout the land were destroyed, and no herb or fruit was to be found. The face of the land was battered and devastated by a hail of stones, which smashed down all that stood in the path of the torrent. They swept down in hot showers, and strange flowing fire ran along the ground in their wake. The fish of the river died in the polluted waters. Worms, insects, and reptiles sprang up from the earth in huge numbers. Great gusts of wind brought swarms of locusts which covered the sky. As the destroyer flung itself through the heavens, it grew great gusts of cinders across the land. The gloom of the long night spread a dark mantle of blackness which extinguished every ray of light. None knew when it was day or when it was night. Book of Manuscripts 615. The darkness was not the clean blackness of night, but a thick darkness in which the breath of men was stopped in their throats. Men gasped in a hot cloud of vapor. 
on the great night of the destroyer's wrath, when its terror was at its height, there was a hail of rocks and the earth heaved as pain rent her bowels. Gates, columns, and walls were consumed by fire, and the statues of gods were overthrown and broken throughout Egypt. People fled outside their dwellings in, in fear and were slain by the hail. Those who took shelter from the hail were swallowed when the earth split open. The habitations of men collapsed upon those inside, and there was panic on every, on every hand. But the slaves who lived in huts in the reed lands at the place of the pits were spared. The land writhed under the, under the wrath of the destroyer and groaned with the agony of Egypt. It shook itself, and the temples and palaces were destroyed. Even the great one, the firstborn of, of Pharaoh, died with the highborn in the midst of the terror and falling stones. Children of princes were cast out into the streets, and those who were not cast out died within their abodes. There were nine days of darkness and upheaval, while a tempest raged such as never had been known before. When it passed away, brother buried brother throughout the land. Men rose up against those in authority and fled from the cities to dwell in tents in the outlands. Egypt lacked great men to deal with the times. The people were weak from fear and bestowed gold, silver, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and copper upon the slaves. And to their priests they gave chalices, urns, and ornaments. Pharaoh alone remained calm and strong in the midst of the confusion. The slaves spared by the destroyer left the accursed land forthwith. Their multitude moved in the gloom of the half-dawn under a mantle of fine swirling gray ash, leaving the burning fields and shattered cities behind them. Many Egyptians attached themselves to this host, for one who was great led them forth, a priest, a prince of the inner courtyard. These details are very, very phenomenal. Let's entertain this tangent just real quick. Incredibly authentic reference to Moses is here without even mentioning his name, who in the Haggadoth and in the Book of Jasher records was an Egyptian prince, a ruler and a former military commander who was raised in the house of Pharaoh. None of the Jewish dressings are here and they are as they are in the biblical Exodus text. We have here a description of a thriving multicultural civilization, a metropolis that totally falls apart. Not in ten mythical plagues like a Jewish drama, but as a prolonged cataclysm that totally ended the civilization in Egypt. The textual evidence in the Colburn manuscripts is of historical records composed independent of or before the Old Testament for which we have evidence was compiled only in the 3rd century BC. This is amazing. Now concerning the escaped slaves in the Book of Manuscripts 627, they turned before Nashari and stopped at Shokoth, the place of quarries. They passed the waters of Maha and came to the valley of Pikaroth toward the Mara. They came up against the waters which blocked their way, and their hearts were in despair. The night was a night of fear and dread, for there was high moaning above. The black winds from the underworld were loosed, and fire sprang from the ground. The hearts of the slaves shrank within them, for they knew the wrath of Pharaoh followed them, and that there was no way of escape. They hurled abuse upon those who led them. Strange rites were performed along the, along the shore. The slaves disputed among themselves, and there was violence. Pharaoh had gathered his army and followed the slaves. After he departed, there were riots and disorder behind him, for the cities were plundered. The laws were cast out of the judgment halls and trampled underfoot the streets. The storehouses and granaries were burst open and robbed. Roads were flooded and none could pass along them. People lay dead on every side. The palace was split and the princes and officials had fled so that none was left with authority to command. The lists of numbers were destroyed. Public places were overthrown and households became confused and unknown. Pharaoh pressed on in sorrow for behind him all was desolation and death. Before him were things he could not understand and he was afraid. But he carried on himself well and stood before his host with courage. He sought to bring back the slaves, for the people said their magic was greater than the magic of Egypt. The host of Pharaoh came upon the slaves by the saltwater shores, but was held back from them by a breath of fire. A great cloud was spread over the host and darkened the sky. None could see except for the fiery glow and the unceasing lightnings which rent the covering cloud overhead. A whirlwind arose in the east and swept over the encamped hosts. A gale raged all night, and in the red twi twilight dawn there was a movement of the earth. The waters receded from the seashore and were rolled back on themselves. There was a strange silence, and then in the gloom it was seen that the waters had parted. 
leaving a passage between. The land had risen, but it was disturbed and trembled. The way was not straight nor clear. The waters about were as if spun within a bowl, and swamp land alone remained undisturbed. From the horn of the destroyer came a high, shrilling noise which stopped the ears of men. Now, the horn of Phoenix continuing to blast from the sky reveals that the parting of the Reed Sea was due to upheaval and the catastrophe, not a legendary Jewish Moses raising his staff to split the waters. Again, the Colburn, Colburn text is the more realistic. In the book of Manuscript 632, we read, The slaves had been making sacrifices in despair. Their lamentations were loud. Now, before the strange sight, there was hesitation and doubt. For the space of a breath, they stood still and silent. Then, all confusion and shouting, some pressing forward into the waters. Okay, now, <clears throat> this video is already 45 minutes long. This concludes our review of the Colburn Bible. It is evident the source materials derived from texts that no longer we just no longer possess, for the narratives of its composition are unique, with no borrowing dictated from perspectives unlike those of other ancient testimonies that relate the same events. This is a valuable addition to the archaic's data on the Phoenix phenomenon. And so far <coughs> excuse me, so far archaics, my own research is the only only source in the entire world for the Phoenix phenomenon. It, this whole, this this whole, I keep publishing YouTube videos about new books, like the Orlin manuscript and Mother Shipton, and all these books that only one copy has been found from the ancient world to survive. I keep I keep finding all these texts, and the, it's just phenomenal that. They all have Phoenix references, and it's just, I'm wondering how many more I'm going to find out that I'm publishing these, and more and more people are finding out and, and uh, giving me references. That's my puppy in the background. I got nine of them. They just, they just won't be quiet. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I don't want to make it unnecessarily long. We have many, many good videos on the way. Me being sick with COVID and hospitalized, <coughs> I'm still taking oxygen. It's just, uh, it, is, it has afforded me a lot of time to put together these videos and, and uh, do do some fact checking on other materials that other people have sent to me. I said, like I said, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, uh, we have some, we have some really interesting videos on the way. I'm not really sure what order they're going to be presented, but we're not done with the Anuna files either. We have some really amazing Anuna files videos that we're going to sum up our Anunnaki research with. This is Jason, Have a good night.